Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is one that I haven't actually heard of before it was suggested to me by you guys, but honestly, I have no idea how I have never heard of it. It is an absolutely horrifying case and I literally could not believe what I was reading as I was reading it. I've seen this case covered a couple of times on YouTube, but I had never heard of it and I think it's just such a horrifying case and it literally sent chills down my spine as I was researching and I'm sure it'll have the same effect on you guys. So I don't really have much more to say about this case so let's just go ahead and get right into it. Today we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Angela Marie Hammond. Angela Hammond was born February 9th, 1971 to parents Marsha and Chris Hammond in Kansas City, Missouri. But when Angela was still pretty young, her family decided to relocate to the small rural town of Clinton, Missouri, 80 miles away. They moved here because Angela's maternal grandparents lived here, so it would make them closer to their grandparents and it just made sense for them, you know, helping raise the kids and with money, especially since after moving here, the couple did go on to have another baby. They had a baby boy named Lauren. Now, Clinton, Missouri seemed like the perfect place to raise Angie and their new baby boy. It was a friendly town where everyone knew everyone, as we say with a lot of these small towns that we talk about. There was fishing ponds, hiking trails, and it was just the perfect place to live if you loved being outdoors and loved being active. Eventually, Marsha and Chris did end up getting divorced. Marsha moved to a new town called Monroe's in Missouri, while Chris moved to Kansas to a town called Olathe, 80 miles away. But the entire divorce was mutual and there were no hard feelings, so Marsha and Chris did their best to maintain a stable, happy life for the kids. Chris was involved with the kids as much as he possibly could be, despite living 80 miles away. Angela seemed to have a very happy childhood and grew up into a very sweet and positive adult. Angela was so tiny, standing at only 4 feet 11 inches tall, and she was described as being smart, kind, and outgoing. She was so full of energy, and her friends have said that she was just so positive and fun to be around. She always wanted to go out and have fun, and was able to make those around her laugh all the time. She was motivated and driven and was just so intelligent that nothing could get in her way. Now, when Angela was 19 years old in 1990, she met a man named Rob Schaefer. He was 18 years old at the time and was a star football player in his high school. He was very popular and had a vibrant personality just like Angela did. He was also very driven and had plans to go on to the military right after graduating high school. Very swiftly, the two became very infatuated with each other and they quickly began dating. Their relationship progressed incredibly fast and only a few months later, in January of 1991, Angela found out that she was actually pregnant. Of course, as soon as Rob found out that Angela was pregnant, he immediately proposed to Angela and she very happily accepted. The two had a very good relationship and they just meshed really well together. They supported each other through all of their endeavors, including Rob's wanting to go into the military. The two had announced their engagement and their pregnancy to both their families and by all accounts, both families were very supportive of their relationship and their choices. Everyone around Rob and Angie could just see how well they got along together and how well they actually belonged together and they just knew that they were a great couple and were going to go on to have a great life together. The two had started planning their lives together, renting a trailer home in Clinton so that they could move in together and start planning for the addition of the newest member of their family. The plan at this point was still for Rob to go into the military, but he worked different jobs here and there to make money for the time being. Angela was attending Central Missouri State University while working nights as a processor at the Union State Bank. Again, she was a very hard-working woman who had big goals and aspirations for herself, and she wasn't going to let anything stop her from succeeding and creating an amazing life for herself and her family. Yes, at this point, money was very tight. They did not have the ideal level of income or the ideal situation and they did struggle financially, 
but the two still seemed very happy. They wanted to be together and save up money so that they could have the life that they wanted for their baby. They believed that no matter what, as long as they had each other and their motivation and their drive, that they were going to make it. Now, Thursday, April 4th, 1991 started as a beautiful day. It was unseasonably warm and Angie and Rob went over to Angie's mother's house for a family barbecue. The two had a really great time enjoying the weather and enjoying the family's company. The two were there until 9 p.m. that night when Robert left so that he could actually go to his own mother's house in Clinton by 10 p.m. that night so that he could babysit his younger brother. Rob had dropped off Angie at their home and then he went over to his mother's house to go and babysit. The two did have plans to meet up again later that night once Rob's parents returned to watch his younger brother. Now, while Rob was babysitting, Angela went and picked up her best friend, Kyla, so that the two could just drive around downtown and just sort of hang out for the night. But by 11.15 p.m., Angela got tired and she decided to go home. So Angie dropped Kyla off at her home, but she was actually just so tired that she no longer wanted to meet up with her fiance that night. Instead, she just wanted to go home and call it a night. So given this information, I'm assuming that Rob was planning on spending the night at his parents' house if the two weren't going to meet up and that the two were only going to meet up once the parents got home so that they could hang out. Otherwise, it sounds like he might have been there for the night, but I'm not 100% sure. But either way, Rob and Angela actually did not have a home phone, so she headed to the nearest payphone on 210 South 2nd Street, only about seven blocks away from Rob's parents' house. She dialed Rob on the phone at around 11.23 p.m., and the two spoke for a total of about 30 minutes. She did not plan for this conversation to be so long. She really only called to check in, but the two had just gotten talking about their day and about their plans for the next day. And like I said, they just got along so well together and they meshed so well together that time just flew by as they were chatting to one another. However, her normally happy and bubbly tone quickly changed as Angela started expressing concerns about this dark green truck that she had noticed that was driving around the block several times and each time it passed her it started driving very slowly rob asked if she recognized the car or the man who was driving it but she didn't she said it was a green ford f-150 pickup truck but she could not get a really good look at the driver now after a minute or two of this truck kind of passing by her the truck had just left, so she felt a momentary relief. However, the truck did return, but this time the truck pulled into a parking spot and the man walked over to the phone booth that was right next to the one that Angela was in. As all of this was happening, Angela was pretty much just describing everything that was happening to Rob. They were pretty scared, they were concerned, but they thought that maybe this man had just been lost, maybe he needed to go to the phone booth to go ahead and call for some directions. Then after entering the phone booth, this man left the phone booth to go back to his truck, and then he returned back a few seconds later carrying a flashlight and waving it around as if he was looking for something in the truck. Again, Angela was scared, but Rob just thought that maybe the phone had been out of order and maybe he was just going back to his truck to go ahead and wait for the phone that Angela was using, which is a very understandable assumption, especially given that at this time, people mostly used pay phones to call people. They didn't have cell phones. So this was understandable that this man was just waiting to use a pay phone. Plus we have to imagine that not everyone watches true crime and is interested in this type of thing. So they probably, especially Rob, weren't totally concerned at this point because again, not everyone's mind jumps immediately to something bad happening. But then Rob had heard Angie lean out of this phone booth to ask the man if he needed to use the phone booth. And he actually said no. So of course, at this point, the two were really starting to feel uneasy about the situation. So Angela started to describe this man to Rob. She said that he was white, wearing overalls, with a dark baseball cap, wearing sunglasses, 
and she said that he had a beard and appeared to be very dirty. For a split second, once again, this man went back into his truck, and then Angela just turned her back to him to continue speaking to Rob. But then, all of a sudden, Rob heard a horrifying, blood-curdling scream coming from at the other end of the phone. He then heard a man's voice saying, I didn't need to use the phone anyways. Immediately, Rob dropped his phone and booked it to his car to drive over to the phone booth, which was literally a one or two minute drive. As he was driving, he saw a truck coming in the opposite direction and noticed that this truck did fit the description of the one that Angela had seen. He also noticed a woman in the front seat of this car leaning over the man who was driving to try and scream out of the window. She screamed, Robbie, begging for help. Of course, Rob stopped his car very quickly and made a sharp U-turn to go ahead and chase the truck. He was able to chase this truck for about two miles before Rob's truck actually started struggling. Soon, the truck made a sharp turn down a side road but as soon as Rob had made that sharp turn as well to continue following, his car completely died. So there he was, sitting in the middle of the road, watching his pregnant fiance being driven away by some random abductor, completely helpless. He just had to sit there and watch as this truck completely faded out of view. He tried to run after this truck on foot, but obviously there was no way that he was just going to be able to catch up to this truck. The only thing that made sense at this point was just to head back into town on foot. Luckily, he saw a car that was driving by and called out for help. This driver picked him up and took him directly to the police station and he arrived just around midnight. He talked to police and he did his best to describe everything that just happened the best of his ability. He gave the description of this man saying that he was dirty and wearing overalls. He described the truck as being an old 60s or 70s green Ford F-150 with a white top with a bit of damage to the front left side fender. He said that he was able to make out the letters X and Y from the license plate and said that the license plate was rusty. Then, on the back of this truck's window, Rob actually said there was a decal of a mural of a fish jumping out of water. Based on all of this information, police came up with a composite sketch of what this man could have looked like. However, the composite sketch didn't really seem to look like the person that they had described. The man they described had a beard and a mustache, but they drew him clean shaven. This could have been because police believed that it was possible that he was wearing a fake beard and mustache, but even so, they could have drawn him in several ways. We've seen in a bunch of other cases where they will come up with a bunch of different sketches of the same person, but with different lengths of hair, different facial hair, all of that to cover their bases. So immediately, police go all out on their search for Angela. They tried to trace down the path that he could have taken, but obviously this was several minutes later, more than a half hour later, so they were way behind this truck and had no way of knowing where it went. But at the same time, the other thing kind of hindering them finding Angela was that police were also very skeptical of Rob. This story seemed too perfect. It seemed too convenient, and of course, he was the fiance. They were a very young couple who were pregnant, so there's always the thought that maybe this relationship that they had actually wasn't so great. Maybe he actually didn't want this baby and he saw getting rid of Angie as the only way out of a life of young fatherhood. So as you can imagine, the small town did not have much of a police force and they were not very well equipped to deal with a crime of this magnitude. But even still, they wanted to do whatever they could to figure out exactly what was going on. They only had one detective at this point, but this one detective did go out and did his best to search for clues and try to get an idea of where she could have gone. But eventually, they did end up requesting help from the Missouri State Police and the FBI. As all of this was going on, the Clinton police notified Angela's parents of the horrible news that Angela had just been abducted. 
Immediately, her father, Chris, drove the 80 miles down to Clinton to help with the search. Again, police were wondering if maybe Rob could be responsible. But right away, Angela's parents dismissed the accusation. They knew just how good of a pair the two were together. Plus, with a lot of cases, when the spouse or the boyfriend or significant other is responsible, they tend to exhibit certain behaviors that are not typical of someone who is grieving a horrific loss. But Rob was horrified. He was broken and he desperately wanted his fiance back. He was questioned several times, but throughout every single questioning, his story remained solid. Soon after searching, police had found Rob's car sitting in the middle of the street, completely broken down and undrivable, just like Rob had said, in the very same location that Rob had told them it was in. They had also found Angie's car in the parking spot at the shopping center by the phone booth with her purse still inside, which also agrees with Rob's account of that night. News broke of this abduction and police started to get absolutely overwhelmed with tips. People were calling in, basically confirming that they had seen the same thing, that they had seen this green truck with this woman who was screaming for help. This also helped confirm Rob's story. Now, with the help of the FBI, local police followed several of these tips, and one common name that stood out to them was that of 17-year-old Bill Barker, who was Angela's ex-boyfriend. Now, as it happens in small towns like this, rumors started to spread about Bill Barker. They started to say that Angie was actually carrying his child and not Rob's. Both Rob and Bill denied this, but police were not too quick to shoot this idea down. About a week after the disappearance, both Rob and Bill were taken into questioning. Bill was questioned for several hours, but maintained that he had nothing to do with her disappearance and he said that there was no hard feelings between them. They had a very amicable split and that the two had actually remained friends and there was no possible way that this baby was his. He told police that he had absolutely no reason to hurt Angie. Rob was also questioned by police for several hours and was asked if he knew anything about Bill and they had kind of insinuated that maybe the two had worked together. Obviously, Rob said this was a ridiculous accusation, and like I said earlier, everything that Rob said was consistent with a grieving fiance. His story was solid, and other than this baby scandal, there was absolutely nothing pointing to Rob whatsoever. Both Bill and Rob took polygraph tests, and they both passed, basically confirming that both of them had nothing to hide. Now, as we say in pretty much every video that involves a polygraph test, we know that polygraph tests are not the most accurate and they can't totally be relied on by any means, but at this point, there was absolutely nothing pointing towards the either of them and police knew that they needed to start looking in other directions. So at this point, they were really just trying to look anywhere that they possibly could to see if they could find any clues with Angela's whereabouts. Just like with so many cases that happen in small towns, Angela's disappearance hit Clinton really hard. Hundreds of people from the town came together to put up missing persons flyers everywhere on storefront windows, light posts, and truck stops. Over 250 volunteers, including friends, family, police, and just people from the neighborhood came out to help with the search. They searched through old abandoned buildings, desolate backwoods, isolated roads and fields, and anywhere that they possibly could to see if they could find a single piece of evidence that could lead them to figuring out where Angie was, but they found absolutely nothing. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Clinton police had actually recruited the help of the Missouri State Police. They had actually asked them to help search their computer system to see if they could get a hit on this green Ford F-150 truck that they were so desperately searching for. However, this came up with over 1,500 hits 
for possible trucks matching this description. Obviously, this was very difficult and very overwhelming. So even after trying to look into each and every one of these trucks to see if any of them could be related, they came up with absolutely nothing. The Clinton police had even reached out to the Missouri Rural Crime Scene Squad to get help from them. They soon had help from 25 different police officers from 15 different counties who wanted to help in the investigation. But even still, with all of this extra help, they were coming up with nothing. So at this point, they were absolutely dumbfounded on how a crime that happened in such a small town with so many different witnesses who literally saw the crime and the truck came up with absolutely no clues and no suspects. The investigation was leading them nowhere, so police had no choice but to search different avenues than the one that they were already on. So at this point, police were starting to wonder if there was a possibility that Angie's disappearance was connected to two other similar disappearances that had happened nearby in the prior two months. So the first of these two abductions was involved a woman named Trudy Darby from nearby Max Creek, Missouri. On January 19th, 1991, 42-year-old Trudy was working a late night shift at the local candy convenience store. It was around 10 p.m. when Trudy was closing up the store when she noticed three men lurking around the parking lot outside of the store. She was very uncomfortable with these men just kind of being out there, not really having a reason for being out there, thinking that they were there to possibly rob the store. So she had actually decided to call her son Waylon to come to the store and walk her to her car. He agreed, but by the time he actually arrived only 10 minutes later, Trudy was nowhere to be found and neither were these three men. Only two days later, on January 21st, Trudy's body had been found nude 15 miles away from the store in the Little Niagara River after being shot twice in the head by a 38 caliber firearm. Then, about a month after that, on February 27, 1991, there was yet another disappearance that seemed very similar to Trudy's and Angela's. In Nevada, Missouri, another small town about 80 miles away from Clinton, a 30-year-old woman named Cheryl Ann Kenny was working at the Quality Convenience Store on Business Highway. Also, at around 10 p.m. that night, she decided to close up shop. Now, this was earlier than she normally closed up the store because the store usually stayed open until around midnight, but business was very slow that night, and she just really wanted to get home to see her husband and her two children. At the time, there was one male customer in the shop as well as the store's janitor. She told the janitor that he could go home early and that as soon as the customer left, she was going to go home as well. Now, I will note that according to this janitor, as he was walking out of the store into the parking lot, he only saw two cars, his own and Cheryl's. But it is thought that this male customer did leave the store because at around 10.17 p.m., she closed up the store and set the alarm. But sadly, she never made it home and we don't know exactly what happened to her. What we do know is that the following day, her Chevrolet was found in the parking lot and a witness came forward saying that they heard a woman's scream at around 10.17 or 10.30 the night that she went missing. So looking at this area and how these towns are right next to each other, even forming almost a perfect triangle, police thought that it was very possible that these cases could be connected. However, after a year had passed and there was almost no movement in the case, the interest in her case inevitably shrank and the people working on the case dwindled. There was nothing that was giving them any leads and so many people were just so confused and frustrated. In the months following Angie's disappearance, life was not easy for the family or Rob by any means. As you can imagine, Rob felt incredibly guilty for all of this because he felt that it was his responsibility to protect her. He was literally on the phone with her when she was abducted and he felt that he could have prevented it or stopped it, but he didn't. But despite this incredible guilt for not only losing his fiance, but his unborn child, Rob actually made it to Virginia to train for the National Guard 
just like he had always dreamed. Years passed and Angela's parents continued feeling guilty and horrified for everything that happened. It took a very long time for Marsha to finally get her life back to normal and live her life the best way that she knew how, despite her daughter being gone. The case remained stagnant for a very long time, until three years later in the summer of 1994, when the case of Tree Darby was actually solved. The men responsible for brutally murdering Tracy Darby were 15-year-old Jesse Rush and his half-brother, Marvin Chaney. So apparently, Jesse was so excited about what he had done to this innocent woman that he went to Kansas City and bragged to several friends that he had just killed and sexually assaulted this woman and then got away with it. Thankfully, these friends were absolutely shocked and horrified at what Jesse had just told them that they did go straight to police. He was arrested and questioned and ultimately he did confess to police what he had just done. Even when speaking to police, he seemed very pleased with himself and was not shy about telling every single detail of what he did to this poor woman. So he said that him and Marvin had planned this entire thing ahead of time. They went into the store and held her up at gunpoint, making her open the cash register and stole $220. They took her to her car and tried to force her in, but she was an absolute fighter and did everything that she could to try and defend herself. But unfortunately, this just made them more angry. So they put her in the car and took her to a nearby barn where they sexually assaulted her and shot her and put her in the trunk, then drove her body to Little Niagara River to dump her body. But when they got to the river, they noticed that she was still actually breathing and she was still alive, so they shot her once more. Now, while Jesse was in prison awaiting trial, he befriended a man named Edward Thomas. Now, he thought that this man was a lawyer and could somehow help lessen the charges against him. So, because of this, Jesse ended up writing a total of 13 letters to this man, basically admitting every single thing that he did in graphic and disturbing detail, but also alluding that he may have done this to several other women and have just never been caught. Now, I won't read the one about Trudy because I find it very disturbing, and we pretty much already know what happened and he talks about her in a very disgusting manner so i just don't think it's necessary i am going to be linking the article where i found a lot of this information for this video and the article it does have the letter so if you want to go ahead and read the letter in full go ahead and check out that article but i will read the one that he sent about him possibly being involved in several other crimes but I will be rephrasing some of it because it is just filled with profanity and I don't like swearing in my videos. So again, if you want to read the completely uncensored version, be sure to check out the article that I have linked. The letter reads, I never told you about them other ladies because if I get found by accident, it can get us involved in killing them and other effing ladies. The cops don't even know about my brother and me killing any other ladies except Max Creek. The other ladies in my last letter to you were both like that lady and Max Creek. We all tortured ladies and then effed the dog poop out of them. So basically he's saying that he had done this before to several other women in a similar way that he had done this to Trudy and he just had not been caught yet. So police tried to find out if there was absolutely anything that could possibly be connected to Jesse or Angie's disappearance, but they couldn't really find anything. By April of 1997, Jesse Rush and Marvin Chaney were found guilty of these crimes and were both sentenced to life in prison. In 2017, Marvin died in his jail cell due to natural causes. But either way, there hasn't been any mention of Cheryl or Angie by either of these two men, and we have to consider the possibility that these two men could have just been making up these other crimes that they committed. Obviously, we know that he bragged about getting away with killing Trudy, so I would not put it past him to just make up these other victims that he got away with to make himself seem badder or whatever, I don't know. So after this, there hasn't really been much movement in the case, but there have been a couple of possible sightings. So one of these sightings came from a man in Manitoba, Canada. So this man said that in September of 1991, 
he saw a woman fitting Angie's description getting into a green pickup truck with a white top with the mural on the back window where he lived in Manitoba, Canada. He said that in October, he was actually visiting his family in Ulrich, Missouri, when he actually saw a missing persons flyer for Angela and suddenly realized that he had in fact seen her. So because of this, the Clinton police actually contacted the Royal Canadian Mounted Police to let them know. They figured that since Angela was four months pregnant when she went missing in April, by the time in September when she was sighted that she would have had the baby already. So they went to a bunch of different hospitals and a bunch of different baby stores with a picture of Angela to see if anyone had recognized her, but unfortunately, nobody has. So again, this just seemed like another dead lead. Near the end of 1991, Unsolved Mysteries did a reenactment of Angie's disappearance in hopes to bringing new attention to her case, but again, unfortunately, nothing came of that either. For years, there has been absolutely no movement in the case, and police have pretty much ruled out Jesse and Marvin as being responsible. But then, by April of 2009, police actually came out to say that there was new DNA evidence in the case due to advances in forensic science, but to this day, we have no idea what this new evidence means or what the new evidence even is. So other than just them saying that there was new evidence found, we don't actually know what it is. To me, I almost wonder if police almost jumped the gun saying that they found this new evidence and then it turned out to be nothing because I just feel like if it was something important, that we would know by now. It's been over 10 years and that is a long time to just be sitting on evidence that's really crucial and really important without any big leads coming of this or them at least telling us what it was. It's been almost 30 years since Angie's disappearance and somehow we still have absolutely no answers. Angel's baby would be a full grown adult with a job and possibly kids of their own by now. Angie just seemed like such a light to everyone's life around her and I know that her and Rob would have made amazing parents to that child and any other children that they may have gone on to have. The Hammond family still continues fighting for Angie and making sure that her legacy is not forgotten. They still love Rob and consider him part of the family and know that he is just as torn up inside about this as they are. Rob was actually able to move on and do great things in his life. He moved away from Clinton and actually works a construction job and has a family and his own children. It's just absolutely heartbreaking that Angela never got the chance to do the same. So now let's discuss some of the main theories in Angie's case. So the first theory is that she was the victim of one of the many serial killers who had committed crimes around Clinton. And within this theory, there are two specific names that stood out to police and other people looking into this case. So one of these men is named Kenneth McDuff. Now, Kenneth had a long history of different crimes, starting with burglary and theft when he was just a teenager. By the time he was 18 in 1964, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison, but he was paroled in 1966 after only serving for two years. So by August of that year, him and a friend were actually just driving around looking for women to hang out with that night. He spotted a 16 year old girl named Edna Sullivan and two of her cousins. So the men approached them with a pistol and told the three teens to get into the trunk of his car. They then drove them into a field and told Edna to get into the trunk of the friend's car who had been following behind. After she got out, he fired two shots into the trunk of the car where the two other teens were still there, killing Edna's two cousins. He then took her to another location and then sexually abused her and then killed her as well. He and his friend then dumped her body in a field and just left. Eventually, he went to police and confessed what he had just done and got a life sentence. However, he had convinced the court that it was actually his friend who was the main perpetrator and that he was basically just this innocent man who was forced into participating. So, of course, by August of 1989, 
he was paroled. We don't know much about his movements for the first few years that he was out, but by 1991, he was back to killing when he killed Brenda Thomas, who was a sex worker in Waco, Texas. After this, we know of several more murders that he committed in just the most heinous and disgusting ways imaginable. By mid-1992, he was finally arrested in Kansas, Missouri, where he had been living for a while. He was asked if he was involved in Angela's disappearance, but he said that he had absolutely nothing to do with it. Now, he did admit to a bunch of other murders that he committed, but he continued to maintain that he had absolutely nothing to do with Angie. So because of this, there isn't really a for sure way of knowing if he could have been responsible, but given the fact that he admitted to several other crimes, a lot of people believe that he would have admitted if he did have something to do with Angela's death. The one thing that does connect him to her is the fact that he was living in Missouri when he was arrested, and we don't know his whereabouts around the time that Angie went missing, so he definitely could have had something to do with it, but we're not 100% sure. The other name that comes up when it comes to serial killers is that of Tommy Sells. So he has quite the long history of killing with his first victim being when he was only 15 years old. He is thought to have killed as many as 20 other people. He is also known to have stolen and driven around different trucks and many of his victims were very small, petite, good looking women just like Angela. Plus, if you look at him, versus the description that Angela gave of the man who was lurking around her. He fits it pretty perfectly with his long hair and his long beard. He was known to have killed women in several different states, so it's possible that he could have been in Missouri when Angela went missing. He too was executed for his crimes and he never admitted to harming Angela, but as we know with so many killers in general, there's always the possibility of them being responsible for so many more murders than we actually know about. So again, we don't know 100% for sure. We don't even know if he was in the state at the time, but because of his history of going to so many different states, he very well could have been. But again, we don't know. So within this theory, those are the two main names that have come up with her case. So the next theory is that she was taken by someone completely random. Maybe it was someone who wasn't from the area and was just passing through. Maybe it was someone from the area who just took the opportunity to go ahead and harm her. Either way, with this theory, it's thought that it could have just been a crime of opportunity. So, at least to me, the way this man took her seemed to be very risky. She was on the phone, so it was clear that someone was on the other end and would hear this entire thing go on. And then, like I mentioned earlier, after her disappearance, there were several other witnesses who saw her in the green truck and who even saw her getting into a green truck. So we know that during the abduction, there must have been some people around. It was pretty late at night, but to me, it wasn't so late that people would be asleep by then. It was still pretty early that people very well could have been out and doing things. There's obviously no way for this man who took Angela to know that the person that she was on the phone with was only two minutes away, but still, doing this right then and there, no matter who she's talking to on the phone, is still very risky. So that, to me, is why I feel like it had to have been a crime of opportunity of maybe someone who was, you know, following her around that night with her friend Kyla or someone who had just seen her alone at the phone booth and just took it as an opportunity. I don't think it was like a longtime stalker or anyone who, you know, knew her previously just because there's no way that this person could have known that she was going to be at the phone booth that specific night when she was. There's no way that this person could have known her plans because she had planned to meet up with her fiance. So if they knew that she had this plan to go meet up with her fiance, they probably would not have chosen that exact time to take her because again, there's no way that they could have known that she had a change of plans. I also want to say I feel like it wasn't someone from the area because I feel like with all of the effort that they actually did put in into finding her in such a small rural town, I feel like someone in the area would have been recognized or if it was someone who lived there, someone would have seen him again or someone 
would see the sketch and recognize him because again it was one of those small towns where everyone kind of knew everyone. So again with this theory it is possible that it was a complete crime of opportunity and that it's someone that police had never even thought to look into and someone not even on anyone's radar. I will mention of course with any of these types of theories it could be human trafficking but at the same time in this specific case it just doesn't seem like human trafficking to me because they do seem a lot more skilled skilled and contrived and they are very very particular about when they take their victims so this just does not seem like something that was pre-planned or something that was human trafficking so the last theory that i will briefly go over is that maybe rob or the ex-boyfriend bill had something to do with it so as we know from earlier there was this entire story from police that maybe the baby that angela was carrying was not Rob's, but it was Bill's, and that maybe they had either worked together to get rid of her, or maybe Bill had done it, or maybe Rob had done it, either one out of jealousy is very possible. Plus, again, we know the fact that Rob was going to be a very, very young father right out of high school, and he had dreams to go on and do other things, so maybe he just didn't want to be a father, and getting rid of Angela was the only way that he knew to get out of it. But again, with either of these theories, I just do not think that this is very likely at all. They both passed polygraph tests, and again, we know that those aren't 100% reliable, but it does say something. I feel like a lot of times when someone fails a polygraph, it's very obvious, and especially with something like this only a week after it happened, I feel like if they were lying, they would at least show some signs of deception. Plus, Rob continued to advocate for Angie since this entire thing happened from the very beginning. Usually when people do something like this, they show a lot of weird behaviors and they try their best to look like they're trying to help with the investigation just to maybe keep their nose in it or, you know, to look to the police like they're not guilty. But with this, he was so genuinely and so desperately trying to find her that I feel like that is really difficult to fake. Nobody is a perfect actor when they do things like this and everybody, no matter who you are, is going to slip up at some point in your life and he never has and he, again, from the very beginning, has been the biggest advocate for finding her. I personally think that this probably was a crime of opportunity. I do think that that is the most likely theory given the circumstances and I personally think, again, if it was a serial killer or someone who had planned this out, they would have been a little bit more careful about it. That's why I think that the crime of opportunity seems the most likely to me. But either way, at the end of the day, the world lost not one, but two souls that night. Someone selfishly ripped Angela's life from her as well as her unborn baby's life. It is absolutely disgusting and my heart breaks for her, her baby, Rob, and her family. Angela Marie Hammond was only 19 years old when she went missing from Clinton, Missouri on April 4th, 1991. She was described as being 4 feet 11 inches tall with brown hair and brown eyes, wearing a white button-down shirt with black spots, black slacks, and white sneakers. She would be 49 years old right now. If you have absolutely any information regarding Angela's disappearance, please contact the Clinton Police Department at 660-885 five five six one so that is all i have for today's video and now i want to know what you guys think do you think that it was one of the serial killers that i mentioned do you think that it was a crime of opportunity do you think that rob could have had something to do with it or do you have a completely other idea of what could have happened please let me know your thoughts in the comments below if you liked this video please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel i put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram, both be linked down below. Also, if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. I read every single case suggestion that I get in every video that I do here on my channel is a suggestion directly from my Patreon or that email. So please do not hesitate to send those over to my email. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.